The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You have a lot of folks who are in this world and for the most part they have made up their own reasons why they're here. I mean, there was a time when I did it before I really began to search and ask the Lord, why am I here in the first place? You know, what am I here for? When you really start to think about that, that's when your life really gets clarified. That's when you start to understand that you're not here for your own cause. That's when freedom takes on a whole new definition. And it's not merely the confines of which man governs man. That's not what freedom is. Freedom is, in fact, absolute liberty. And freedom is skewed, for the most part, twisted, so that it makes it very difficult for a person to actually obtain freedom on multiple levels, causing people to put themselves in bondage mentally. Think about this. How many of you have been incarcerated your entire lives? Not too many, right? How many of you right now are held against your will? Not too many, right? How many of you are allowed to do certain things you want to do? Just about all of you. Which actually means, you guys, you have liberty of movement. You have liberty of thought. You have liberty of speech. You do. The problem is, if you don't see your own liberty, if you don't understand your own liberty, mentally, you'll be in bondage. You can be as free as a bird, but mentally, you can be in great bondage. Bondage with invisible ties. The Lord broke those ties spiritually so that nothing remains. We still have mental scars, scars that are passed down from generation to generation. And we often look at the world as this place that is holding us back and it's mental. It really is mental. It's by way of comparisons. For example, if I look at a person next to me, this person can do more than I can do. I will often begin to evaluate. This is just human. You know, if you're a human, you're going to do this. You'll evaluate yourself based upon what you see. And you'll deem yourself as being in bondage when in truth, you're not. You're free. And why would Satan enrich his followers in the earth? Is it really a reward? No. In just about every single case, when you look at people, rich people, at these um, stars and actresses, not all of them, but your stars and actresses, but some of your political figures who have lots of money, it looks like they are extremely content. It looks like they're so full of joy. And it makes you wonder, why do they... Why are they so full of joy and I'm not? Why are they free and I'm in bondage? But in truth, you don't know how they feel. In truth, you don't know that that smile goes away when no one is looking at them. In truth, there's a reason why they continue to drink alcohol and go to uh, recreational pharmaceuticals to get rid of some of the pain that they face on a daily basis. There are elements we have to deal with. Always elements. God designed it this way. And the only way to become free is through Christ. There's no other way. Many of you have, you've had small successes in your life. Some of you have had mediocre to big successes in your life, but you weren't free. Many of you thought that if you could take care of things financially in your life, you'd be free. But that wasn't so. Many of you thought that if you had that perfect companion, that would complete your life. That was not so. You found out that having what you want in this world only brings more complexities to your life and that there are always mechanisms of bondage you did not see before. But every time you become free of one thing, your eyes are open to several more things. Some of that is due to exposure. But for the most part, we are to grow. Just like a baby in a womb, they're constantly moving and growing. You know what happens if an embryo does not move? You know what happens if a small baby has no desire to stretch? The initialization of their muscles, nervous system, all those integral parts of their system, their body, it won't develop. The body develops by way of constraints. Do you guys know this? So in other words, your body develops because external pressure is always pushing against it. And so your body pushes out by will. It pushes out. This develops muscle. This develops strength. This forges new connections in your neurological system until you reach a point where you have developed organs. You have coordination. You have strength enough to alter your original position. All these things happen by way of resistance. In the animal kingdom, the same thing happens. Take a baby lion, for example. Small little cub, male cub, in the wild. The cub plays, but the cub is fighting. 
and struggling. It just sounds cute when they're small because they have little bitty roars that come out of their mouth. Sounds like a little kitten. What you don't know is that they're in a daily struggle for dominance. Did you know that? They play. They're driven to overcome. They're driven to be number one. And they have to do this or they would never become a lion. Ultimately, the lionesses kick those lions out of the group, period. And they forbid them to come back once they reach a certain age. So the lions go out by themselves, the males do. Sometimes with others, most of, for the most part, they're just totally booted out of that, of that group of lions. And they're forbidden to come back. When they do come back, though, they will have fought. They will have really exhausted themselves to eat. They will have doubled in size. They will have gained experience. They will have learned traits. And all these things, they're learning through massive resistance. That's what nurtures that young little tiny kitten into being what we call a lion. That scary thing. It's a beautiful thing, but it's also scary. And all of that came about because it was kicked out from the nest, so to speak. All of that came about because it was forced to eat, to hunt by itself, to learn by example, trial and error. It was forced to grow up through resistance. This is our father's way. That's why in the Bible it says, through sufferings, he learned obedience. Who learned obedience? Through sufferings. That was for Christ. Christ had the mindset. He was the word of God spiritually. But do you know that physically he was just like you and I? In the Bible it says, Jesus was tempted in all points as we are but without sin. He did not act on the negativity. He didn't do that. How many of you like uh, albatrosses and eagles? How many of you like those pretty majestic birds, right? Pretty big birds. Did you know they have a very uh, isolated life? They have to endure untold conditions. They become an eagle and their behaviors kick in only by encountering resistance on a, on a daily basis. They would never become an eagle if they were if their situation was padded all the way through. Now, this is something very important to understand because this thing that we see in nature, this thing that we see with ourselves, with a young being raised, something that's very consistent throughout the ages, something that we can't deny ourselves, facing this resistance is how we grow. And do you know what man has been so busy in doing? Trying to remove the element of resistance so that people can just sit back and party because in the back of your mind, what have you been chasing as part of your life? Isn't it true that you've been wanting to really make it in this world? And when I say make it, I mean get rid of those things you don't like that resist you. In other words, God's way is an established way that we grow, that we become exactly what we are. Even by way of Lucifer himself, God allows Lucifer to oppose us. And every time he does that, what happens? We gain strength. We learn. We gather wisdom and understanding. We develop in who we are to develop into because of resistance. Satan goes against God's word. Right? So often we, sometimes we get off course believing a word that's not of the Father's. And then when it falls apart right in front of our faces, immediately we recognize that we shouldn't have gone in that direction. And we go right back to the living God more stronger than we were before why do i say that because satan can make you fall for something one or two times but he will not continue to do it because you learn to identify darkness through this something very important takes place every time he tricks one of you you end up saying that's not me i don't want anything to do with that you know why that's a beautiful statement even by way of biblical principles that is a beautiful statement do you know why because every time you're confronted by darkness you identify who you actually are child of. You actually identify who your family is. You actually identify who you really love. And in every single case, it is God the Father through Christ. Somebody says, uh, why does the Bible refer to Jesus as a lion, the tribe of Judith, and also the devil, as it well says, the devil is used by way of comparison. It says, Satan, he roams as a roaring lion. So his is by way of comparison. Jesus, however, saying that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is God's creation. And a lion, have you noticed that lions have many scars? Lions are fierce. Lions will fight to the death. Lions are king of their environment. So, because this is God's creation, if you notice that God will often take his creation of those parts that we truly understand, and he'll make comparisons, biblical comparisons, of characteristics of Christ. 
of people. That's why when the word beast is mentioned, but there's no, uh, there's nothing specifying what that beast actually is. We always tend to think of an aggressive thing. Something beastly without identification is something totally out of control. A monster, if you will. They didn't quite use that term in the Bible, but it's the same thing. But God utilized, the word came first. Creation came after the word. Creation is modeled of those things of the word. And if you look very carefully and closely, you'll find that uh, just about every single species of animal that we have follows some sort of principle in the Bible. So, so just keep that, because Satan was never called a lion. It says he walks like or roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So it gave, it gave him a comparison to something strong. It did not say he was a lion. You see, he walks around like that. We know he's an imposter. We know he's stripped of certain abilities and powers. We know he's not as strong as he would like to be. But our father is not, Jesus is not an imitation. So when it says he is a lion of the tribe of Judah, a lion holds a position of prestige. He is king of his environment. He has absolute dominance over his environment, right? So, so that's our... That's Christ of the tribe of Judah. Now, that's very important because it says it didn't just say he's a lion. It said the lion of the tribe of Judah. So now we know his position with Judah. And by the way, Judah is very important. Judah and Jerusalem, the distinctions and comparisons, similarities, and their placement, those are very important because they tell a part of the story of Christ and mankind and what we normally do, what we're going to go through, but how God reestablishes his kingdom, his loyalties to his own word concerning us and those people. He gives that comparison of Judah. Judah went through some things. Judah and Jerusalem specifically. Uh, declarations are made for and even against them, but they belong to the living God. They have different characteristics because they're different states of the same thing. It's almost like one is a, one is a future state of the other. Still brothers, right? Still related, but one is a future state of the other in, in certain elements. My point is, God utilizes his creation to tell his word all the time. So he uses elements of his creation to describe very important characteristics of his word. Very important themes of his world. Somebody says, how do you begin to listen for how God speaks to me? Well, the first thing you have to do to hear the most time is to believe in the most time. Not just believe that he is God, right? No, not that. You have to search for him in your own life. You do that by way of sincerity. You already have something that a non-believer does not have. You have confirmation internally that God is real. Look over your life and instead of blaming people in your life and things in your life, instead of doing that pointing fingers, look in your life and see how many things God has delivered you from. Really look for him and ponder him in your life. Because everything he did in your life was for deliverance, so that you could grow, so that you could become the exact individual he placed here on this earth to stand up in a very specific time. He put me here for the sake of some others, not everybody, but for the others. I, I realized a long time ago, I am not here for me. I'm here for God's purpose. He put me here for somebody else, just like somebody else was here for me at one point. He put you here for other people. And other people have been put here for you. And when you start searching for him, you'll become intimate with him. You'll begin to trust him. When you open up those lines of communication with the Lord by way of your prayer, your faith increases. Now you're going to have ups and downs, frustrations, and everything else. Because the world has programmed just about everybody to only accept a person based on worldly terms. In other words, for example, if a person comes through versus a person not coming through, well, let's go ahead and face it. Based on our timing, God does not come through like we want him to. But I'll tell you something. Everything he does is incredibly timely, isn't it? He never moves based upon our calling, but he moves based upon absolute truth and perfect timing. He always has us in mind, and he loves us, and we say that we love him and recognize his love, but the truth is, when we need it and embrace, in our worst troubled times, we didn't always get it did we? Only later on do you realize, yes, God loves you. When you find out the truth of Christ, when you find out all of what the Lord has orchestrated for your lives, that's when you find out he loves you. So I'll tell you something, early discernment 
you know, that discernment people think they have is, is, is somewhat innocent, just like the voice of the Lord. Sometimes people thought they heard the Lord, but in truth they did not. They were convincing themselves to go and attain something they wanted. God never gives me what I want based on the flesh, and I'm so thankful for that. He does supply me what is needed. There's a big difference. Increase your relationship, and the Lord will guide you in greater intimacies with Him. Draw near unto Him, He'll draw near unto you. You will begin to hear Him. He will speak to you in His own special way, just like He does all of us. The way I hear the Most High could be different from the way you hear Him. For example, you may go outside, see something in a tree, and that just does something within your spirit. And that's the Lord speaking with you about something. You may notice something odd and nobody else does. That's the Lord speaking to you, just like a dream. When you dream, the way you perceive your dreams is different than somebody else. I would not want to be in anybody's head when they're dreaming, although that happened once. I was in the barracks. This was in early times. Myself and another person had the exact same dream, and we were having a conversation in the dream. When we woke up, we looked at each other, continuing the conversation. Then we realized we were not dreaming anymore, and neither one of us could believe it. Isn't that funny? That happens. Now that's just, And then it happened again with an, another person that was uh, in proximity with us. So weird things happen like that, but I don't think that's so weird. You know what I think that is? I think that people believe what man says. And when you stop believing the limitations man teaches, and you start really looking at the word of God to learn who your father is. And when your faith is tuned to what the Lord said is real and what the Lord said is right, I believe based upon that tuning, based upon that viewpoint, your faith opens up many things within you and you'll find that you have more capabilities than you ever thought possible. You'll not communicate those capabilities because you realize that the world, right, all of the world is not a believer and you'll not want to waste, right, anything by telling it to someone who likes control. Oh, but I need to tell you this. Give up control. Have your life managed in this way. Most people try to control every aspect of their lives. And they get angry when they lose that control. If something can make you angry, if it can make you angry, you're missing the point of life concerning that area in the first place. You will get angry at things. But you will also grow that nothing will anger you again. Remember something. The Lord is in control of your life. Be a good steward. For example, look around at your house. Everything in your house, look around at it and just simply say, thank you, Lord. Let me use this for the kingdom. And of course, there are going to be some forgive me's in there too, because some things we keep in our homes are not quite in line with what the Lord would uh, allow, nor can we use them for anybody else. A lot of things people put in their homes are to beautify their home for themselves. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you begin to worship it, or you won't let people touch it, if it breaks and you yell at everybody in the house, then that, whatever that thing is, should not be in your home. If you have something in your home that will cause you to degrade another human being because of something hanging on the wall, get rid of it. Those are the very things. The Lord said, don't have those around yourself. By getting rid of those things, you'll find that your entire life changes. You'll also break ties, ties that you never thought existed. That goes for cars too. If you have a car that you idolize, get rid of it. Better for you not to have that car than for your whole person to be condemned and separated from the living God. We have things that make us do such things. If you if you would get angry because a child would touch a precious picture, something you deem as precious because of its memories, get rid of it, put it away, because you'll find yourself out of touch with what the Lord would have you do, and you'll try to preserve yesterday. You'll do that with strengthening your guard yesterday, not allowing anybody to take anything away from you. When, when another person can't take anything away from you, by the way, they can't take anything away from you. But these things that we do, the Lord told us not to have these things, but we do so anyway. Just because the world says it's okay and normal does not mean it's okay and normal. That's why God's word is so good, though. God's word is, is incredibly good. It really is good. And if those people in the world would actually sit down and start to believe it, they've already read it, but they don't believe it. If they were to believe it, things would change overnight. But we're going to get there anyway, because all those who don't believe, as we read in Estras and in other places of the Bible, now we will see who really believes and who does not. Now we're going to see who really belongs to the living God and who does not. 
You cannot see that peacetime. You can't see that when no opposition has come. You can't see that when everything is okay. But when everything is going wrong, when the opposition does come, then you'll find out who truly loves the Lord, but only at a time of, of dire straits, so to speak. That's when you are. You will not know in any other time. Because let's go ahead and face it, when things are peaceful, what do we do? We act. We're very good actors. Well, though all of us have a, should be getting a pretty good paycheck from Hollywood, we're really good actors. We know that we present to other folks what we want them to hear and see. We already know this. We know that we hide behind characters we create, behind personalities that we create, and we engage people every day with these personalities. I remember somebody said, well, how do you know if you know someone? I said, you don't. You don't know if you know someone. That, that's not our primary task, is to know people. That's what the world has to do, because they're so skeptical. They're not willing to sacrifice anything. So their entire premise of everything they do in the world is not to lose anything. But for the sake of good, for the sake of Christ, a true believer has already agreed and they're willing to lose much. So to us, this is simple sacrifice. But to your flesh, your flesh is trying to save everything it can. It's trying to save everything. It does not want to lose a thing. It wants security. And it does not like anybody tampering with security. The more you become spiritual, the less you'll react to those things of flesh. The less you'll worry. The less you'll be angry. People always ask, how do I overcome anger? How can I, how can I overcome anger like that? Grow spiritually. When you grow spiritually, your flesh has no power over you in certain areas. When you grow spiritually, you begin to convey who you really are to folks. Whether they accept it or not, you begin to convey the truth of yourself to other folks. You also become primarily concerned about somebody else's walk. That's when you grow spiritually. If you have not grown spiritually, you're going to have to deal with lots of emotions, lots of uh, mood swings and everything else. All these are fits of carnality of the flesh. But by way of the spirit, the spirit is stabilized through the power of the living God. That's all. Somebody says, Satan is on a roll, keeps telling me I'm fake. Don't listen to him. Listen to what the Lord say you are. What did God say you are? Despite what you've done, despite the wrongs you have allowed yourself to be a part of in this world, despite the works you have originated that have been awful, despite any of those things, your father says you're precious. Your father says that you are worth the life of his son, that you're worth the price of him giving his son over to death at the hands of man. That's how much you're worth. Don't listen to Satan. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Thus, his entire modus operandi is to accuse you. Your Father in heaven has never accused you. Jesus has never accused you. God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Satan says you're a man of sin. You don't deserve anything. Well, we already know that of the flesh. But guess what? Since you have given your life to Christ, you're no longer flesh but your spirit. So what Satan speaks to is your flesh. He has no inheritance with anything of your spirit. He can only see your flesh. So he can only accuse you of those things of your flesh. God sees you by way of the blood of his son. So he does not see your flesh at all. God sees the born again you. And that's what your father in heaven is interested in raising. Not your flesh, but the born again you. Your father won't accuse you. While well, Satan's accusing, God had already planned to redeem you, to reposition you, to give you the ground back that was lost through Adam, throughout the generations, up to the point of Christ, to restore all of us, to bring us all the way home. Don't listen to Satan. Satan will always accuse. When Satan works through people, people accuse you. Expect Satan to be Satan. Never expect Satan to be a saint. If somebody saw a demon, would they say, well, that demon is trying to defile me? Well, of course he is. That's what they're supposed to do. That shouldn't be shocking. So don't be shocked by the works of darkness. The works of darkness are dark. But focus on what the Lord has already established before you. Seek to hear him that you may follow close with him. He's a good father and a very patient father. That's why the Bible, this printed Bible, is a blessing, isn't it? Even the Bibles on the internet that speak his word, they are a blessing. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys something, part of a secret weapon. Let me give you my secret weapon. It keeps me grounded. And I already know what happens should I never contemplate that story. Over and over again, I go into the New Testament as often as I can. I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's my secret weapon. Because every time I hear the story of Christ, 
Everything is brand new to me, yet again. Nothing is old. You know how sometimes you've already heard Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it seems old. But take note of something. In those moments when you're feeling this way, isn't it true that you've also slacked off in reading the New Testament, specifically the New Testament? Isn't that true? Isn't it true that when the New Testament becomes boring, it's because you've slacked off from reading in the first place and that your prayer life could be dwindling. Isn't that true? But when you build that back up again, by going back into the Gospels, realizing what Jesus did for you, it kindles a fire. And it's that fire it kindles. And when somebody comes with an accusation against you and you have a fire kindled in you, they know they're going to get burnt. So they normally don't come to you like that. Haven't you noticed they come to you in a moment of weakness? When you're unsure about things, that's when Satan comes to you. Haven't you noticed that? He comes to you when you're weak, when you have a moment of weakness, when you're getting tired, when you seem hopeless, when things are not working out. Because Satan has a general way that he acts, that he reacts to humanity. He will kick you when you're down. He takes advantage of you when you've already been hit. He gets you at your weakest state to maximize his blow. So then, lesson number one, never get to a point where you are weakened. Don't rehearse this statement. Stop saying, well, I'm tired. I just need a break. Don't rehearse those things. Don't let those things enter into your vocabulary. Don't say, well, I just need to get away from everybody. Stop saying those things because that's not what you need to do. That's what the world teaches that you need to do. And consequently, the teachings of the world will weaken you by way of your faith. If you have to go all the way back and watch the Ten Commandments again, then go watch it. Whatever it takes. In my case, I revisit the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The story of Christ. That's my secret weapon. Because every time I revisit that story, something comes alive in me stronger than it was before. I mean, I get to the point where I don't care what I have to face. Because again, I realize over and over again that Jesus gave all for me and nobody else did. Nobody else will ever compare to the love shown to me through Christ Jesus at the cross. And that was already established. No one can take that away. One thought of that and I'm on fire again. And it does not matter what condition I'm in. It doesn't matter if I'm sick or not. If I have resources, none of that matters anymore. I am willing to do whatever is necessary for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that same gospel that lights a fire in me is the same gospel that will free those who are in bondage right now. And they need that gospel. And you have been designated to carry that gospel. Period. You're not just someone who believes. You're also someone with a mission. And if you have a mission, no wonder in the Gospel of John it says, too many as believe upon his name has he given power to become sons of God. A son of God is the direct creation of God. A new creature in Christ, you know what that is? That's a direct creation that did not come through the flesh, but by the Spirit. That means, yes it does, that means the sons of God, that's a title for the angels. That means you are also a messenger. You have the powers of a messenger right here on this earth. That means you have the power of an angel right here on this earth. And do you know what an angel can do? It takes one angel, one angel to decimate the entirety of the beast kingdom. One angel destroyed a huge part of this earth by orders of the Most High. And they were kingdoms of darkness. One angel, it takes to bind Lucifer for a thousand years. Think about that. One angel can do that. And you know what the Lord said about you? If you believe upon his name, because you're the call to as many as believe upon his name, has he given power to become sons of God? He already initiated something for you, but it's up to you to accept. He'll not force it upon you. He'll not force you to become one of his messengers. He'll not force you to walk around this earth with the powers and abilities of the kingdom. He'll not force you to have that. That's something you have to make a decision toward. If you, if you say yes to giftings of the Spirit, get ready for scrutiny, get ready for the trial. Did you not know that every gift that you carry before it actually comes to fruition, every gift that you carry, God will try you to ensure your worthiness of that gift. Because if you have a gift, people are going to see or catch you operating in that gift in a specific way. Those same people must always see something that aligns with the kingdom when you carry the kingdom power with you. 
because if they see you in any other light, then that power you carry is going to be blasphemed, mocked, and scoffed. They're going to say it's evil. That's what they'll say. So God will qualify you to carry what you carry. Some of you are undergoing those qualifications right now and you can't even see it because things will be bestowed upon you and you don't even know it. See, some of you, you may not realize that you're going to have to have some of these gifts and you're going forward. You're not, a, not, not one of you are to go forward powerless. Why do you think in the book of Acts, Jesus said, do not go outside of Jerusalem until that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he said, after that, you will have power. You will have power. See, you're not to go powerless with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you do that, if you go powerless with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're demonstrating a powerless word. The gospel is not powerless. Oh, and by the way, Jesus is his word. So the word he spoke, he is. And the entirety of Jesus and the word he spoke is in fact the word of the living God. And God watches over his word to perform it. You see, it's not to go forward powerless, and you cannot carry the gospel of Jesus Christ powerless. You cannot carry the gospel of Jesus Christ being a victim of Satan, being a victim of anybody. When you carry the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is kingdom authority that you carry, that's good news of the kingdom of the living God. Somebody says, how can we be sure it's his gifts and not Satan's counterfeit spirit? Satan does not give gifts. Listen to me. Satan can manipulate you into utilizing your God-given authority over the earth in wrong ways. Now, all this ideology about Satan giving gifts, you know they came from television and shows that people watch on TV and theories people have cultivated over time by believing in the doctrines of demons and devils. Listen, don't give heed to the doctrines of demons and devils. Listen to the doctrine that Jesus gave you. Listen to the word that your father gave you. So that means go in your Bibles and accept what you read when God gives you understanding of what you read. Don't pull something out of the air and then believe in that. Don't do that. You don't have to do that. The word is right here. God has given all of us the word. We have to learn to utilize the resources we have right before us. Remember, it says in the last days, men will no longer endure sound doctrine, but would heap in themselves teachers having itchy ears. That means people would rather hear other people talk and they won't be reading their Bibles. They're going to take it by somebody else's word on what to do, what to believe, how to act, and all this and the other. Listen, I'm tell you right now on COT, you better, you, you better read your Bible. Do not hinge your salvation on my word or anybody else's word, but read your Bible. By the way, this is a living word. So if man made a billion errors in the Bible, do you not know that when you read it, God will give you revelation from heaven that's flawless? Hallelujah. He'll do that. It doesn't matter how flawed it may seem to everybody else. By spiritual revelation, God will grant you the truth anyway. He did not base your salvation upon the grammatical errors of mankind. He didn't do that. It is not based on somebody's definitions of what they think words are. If you guys notice, I don't go into a lot of definitions. Do you know why? Because who, who gave you all those definitions? It wasn't the living God. It was mankind. People know what they know through academia. Academia came through mankind. And they lead people astray through academia. Because it's consistent with man, people accept that as truth. But God keeps telling us that the world does not have the truth. So if you don't receive it by revelation and truth, you don't know for real anyway. They bedazzle you with computers. They bedazzle you with gadgets and cars. And because those things work, you assume that their philosophies are true. Even our language. God didn't give us this language that we speak. Man did. That's why everything's going to be returned back to one language. See how that works? Everything man did is going to be undone. That's the very thing man hates. All the kingdoms of these worlds are going to be undone. All the kingdoms people have just died for, spilt blood for, and everything else, they're going to be undone. There's only one kingdom that will stand in the end, and that's the everlasting kingdom. All the other kingdoms will have fallen, and they will have been crushed into pieces. Even the residue of those pieces will be smashed into dust. They will not exist. I'm extremely concerned about people's houses in order. I'm concerned about my own house in order. Do you guys know I did a walkthrough today to make sure that I have nothing of waste around me? If the Lord called me, there will be nothing in my possession that will have not been used for the kingdom of God. Not even a fort. Nothing. Because I will not be accountable for having an abundance of something I did not use for what God loves so much. 
And of all things, what does God love the most? You. Of all of his creation, what is the most precious thing he deemed precious? It is you. I'm also becoming concerned about those who are going to be here on this earth, and I won't be able to help them. So I've gone back through certain notebooks to make sure that everything is worded just right. If anybody ever comes behind me, they're going to find a slew of things. It's designed to help them. When people see a good person doing everything they can to make something work like an old man changing a tire and he's not asking anybody for help, people would likely turn around and try and help that guy. But if you saw another person sitting on the side of the road, they didn't even open the trunk and they're trying to wave down cars to get everybody to help them change a tire, people are going to pass that person by. Here's what it is. When people see you putting forth an effort in your area that you need help in, they will assist you. When people don't perceive an effort in the area you need help in, they're not going to do a thing. Or if you try to voice it every single time, you try to make people help you, they're going to pass you by. Why is that? Because people are kind and they want that kindness to be a freedom. They don't want their kindness turned into an obligation. I have a, I have a strong sense in that area. If anybody out there were to ever try to tell me or instruct me on how to do something very specific that they would only ever say, well, do it this way, not that way, then it ceases from being a gift to them. I like giving gifts. In other words, I like doing things for people they didn't ask for, right, that they didn't demand. But when they start demanding it, there's no gift involved. That's why God loves a cheerful giver. He does not want to demand anything from anybody. He loves a cheerful giver. When you give your help, when you give your time, when you give your everything to somebody else, and you do it with an upright heart, with that desire, because you want to, well, that changes everything. But when, by reason of a mandate, when you respond to an order or mandate, there's no cheerfulness in that. That's an obligation. That's why married couples started having problems because they lost the foundation of the entirety of marriage. Marriage is about freedom, not about bondage. People burn with desires all the time because it's in their flesh. And when they get married, they have freedom. They don't have that worry anymore. But what they did was when two people get married now, they look at each other and say, well, you, they have a to-do list. You're supposed to do this. The other person's supposed to do this. And that causes an obligation and pressure. It makes everything like business. Satan did that. When two free hearts get together, one will always try to do whatever they can for the other. When two people date, they do it. They look at each other and they try to outdo each other by way of love, don't they? But when they get married, society has trained them to break out their to-do list. Well, you're the husband, so you're supposed to take out the trash. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. And then it ruins it because if somebody tells you what you're supposed to do, you have no more freedom of heart to be a blessing to somebody else because they're always expecting something. That's why I don't like man-made holidays. I don't, I don't, because it's false, it's fake. If you're gonna love someone, love them every day, not just one day out of the year. But the bad part about it is you can love someone every day out of the year, and if you don't give somebody something on a holiday, they will swear up and down you don't love them. So that's hypocrisy. I don't like that for that very reason. I don't like that. Because if you don't do something on a man-made designated day, then people will just, you know, act like you. So I don't participate in those things on purpose. I don't like them. I don't even have my own birthday. I don't have that. Because I'll not join in with it. Those things are false when it comes to love. Real love is something that's not mandated. It's something that's given every day. Not just one day out of the year. Every day. It's something that people meditate about. And those people you love, they don't leave your mind. You're always thinking about them. Like Christians. You know how Christian people will say, well, they'll go to another Christian. Well, somebody needs help. They'll say, well, let me go pray about it. I'm not like that either because I don't need to go pray about it. If somebody needs help from me, I have the ability to help somebody. I do not need to pray about it because Jesus has already spoken about it. I need to act. It's an emergency. Have you ever needed help from somebody in the Christian community? Your own family, friends, and somebody said, let me go pray about it, but it was an emergency. And then something strange happens. The same person who didn't like that will turn around and say the exact same thing. Let me pray about it. See, you got to be careful not to be taught of men, but to be taught of the word. If a man has the word, then good. But the doctrines of men are destructive. It's something I even have to fight every day of my life. I'm drawn and pulled and tugged in a few directions right now. 
you have this bad habit. I, I don't know how to stop doing things, right? You, some, some of us don't know how to quit. Even when something is an impossible task, we don't know how to quit. And we can't break the loyalty of one side to keep the contract with the other. You can't do that either. So sometimes that becomes very difficult. But uh, I used to have an issue with that area, even with COT, but it's becoming easier now. I just say no to other things. In summary, clarity is very important. Don't let me be your example in withholding your tongue to make things known to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't do that. Make things known to your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Make things known. There's, there, I have specific reasons behind things on you. I don't advise that anybody else do them. You can halt other people from being a blessing to you. Don't do that. Don't do that because some people just don't know. So make your requests known with your brothers and your sisters that God has given you to entrust things with. And don't get angry when nobody can do anything. Never get angry if a person does not pray with you where you can see it. Don't do that. I've seen Christians do that too. They'll say, well, you know, my daughter's sick or my son is sick. Can you guys pray? Nobody prays. The person blows up, but nobody prayed. And they go off cussing or something. Man, don't do that. That's false. Because a person's prayer is not going to alter the situation. God will alter the situation. We pray and petition to the living God so that he can do something. We're not the ones who do something through prayer. God does things through prayer. You better believe he knows your condition better than anybody else ever could. And I'll tell you something right now. Of all people on this earth, I would rather the Lord pray for me. How about you? You want me to pray for you? You want the Lord to pray for you? I'm saying this because sometimes people don't always type their prayers. They could be praying in their heads, and then people have these outbursts like nobody's praying. You don't know that. I would say with the utmost of surety that every single last one of you are being prayed for all the time. Never say somebody is not praying for you. Just because you don't perceive it does not mean it does not exist. That's worldly thinking. That's where they operate. That's the same reason why Jesus said they cannot have the truth because they cannot see it. So they do not have the truth.